Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Portfolio Growth. I'm Jake Pelly, and today is June 25th, July 25th, 2019. As always, there's our fun disclaimer. As it's being recorded, you can always forget at your leisure once I post the replay. Also, I know this quote's the same as last week, but man, it pretty much sums up life in the past two weeks here. Opportunities missed by people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Work, for me, has been kids non- stop kids oh man I thought I'd be happy when school was out and the kids would be home I didn't have to worry about picking them up from school man I miss school every day it's dad 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 I wouldn't be surprised if this meetup doesn't get interrupted at least three times asking a question or tattletaling yes I've hit the tattletale age and it's been um it's been fun it's been really fun. As you can tell from my uh, sarcasm, it's not been fun at all. A lot of work, a lot of late nights. The babies have started crawling. And so, if you ever want to see how baby-proof your house is, wait until your your 9-month-old, 10-month-old starts crawling, and you'll find them out real quick. Um, you'll find all the loose change in your house, every pin cap you ever lost, every bottle cap you've ever lost. It'll get found. It will get found that week. <laughs> so... Pretty tired from there. Other than that, life's going pretty good. How are all of you doing today? It's good to have you all here. If there's a stock you'd like me to cover, now would be a good time to type it in chat here, and I will add it to the list. And if there's a stock, option, futures, forex, cryptocurrency, pretty much we can cover it all today. Now, power might go out here because there's a little bit of a flash flood warning going on. It's 110 today here in Fresno, and there's humidity, which we don't get very often. There's clouds all around us, so usually when we get it that hot and we get clouds, we typically get a thunderstorm. So if all of a sudden my screen goes black for some uh, some reason, that's probably because the power ran out because of that. We don't typically get humidity in our 110 days. Usually it's a negative humidity, but it's just how it goes. So the market is down a little bit today on news of antitrust lawsuits against big tech companies. We all knew it was inevitable. We all knew eventually Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, they're all going to get hit with antitrust. The one thing to think about though, Microsoft's already been to this rodeo before, so really they're not going to hit hit too hard. It's really our social media and our Amazons are going to get looked at here. Facebook's going to get hit as well because they kind of have a monopoly when it comes to the advertising space for social media. You can use Twitter, yeah, you can use Snapchat, that's fine too, but a majority of all people who use social media use Facebook, they use What App, they use Instagram, and the antitrust lawsuits currently being brought about are general in scope, and so they don't really have any focused target, so it is kind of worrying for the market. Now, what's interesting is Facebook had pretty good earnings last night, though in the earnings call, unfortunately, they talked about substantial decline in revenue growth. And whenever you hear those words, it's typically pretty bad the next day in the stock. Those are words you don't typically want to hear, that revenue is going to be slowing down potentially from here on out. That tells us that Facebook is looking at potential peak usership. And to be fair, they have the majority of everyone that's going to use social media. So it's going to be kind of hard to grow from here. It's going to be hard to grow in ad revenue. And for those who like to look at numbers, 94% of all their revenue came from mobile. Came from mobile uh, usage. 94%. It was up from 92%. So everyone that's on their phones here... Everyone's on their Androids, their Star, um, Samsungs, their iPhones, using the Facebook app. That's where a majority of their revenue came from, from advertising there. Mobile. So, though it was up, so that's pretty good to see expansion. You can see right there, our sales is $58 billion. Our income is almost $20 billion. So, that's some good revenue numbers there. If we go ahead and do a little math there, you can see that we're going to call it just 19 divided by 58. That's 32% income on sales to income. Now, what's interesting about Facebook is they're a huge market cap of uh, $591 billion. 
dollars. Now, current market cap is uh, current market value divided by shares outstanding. That's how, if you ever wondered where you get that calculation. Um, that's gigantic, and the amount of sales they do is pretty small compared to that, the bigger fish on there. But it's just interesting to see it kind of tick down. Hopefully not many of you are uh, trading Facebook today or the, you took profit early in the morning. Hello, Forbes. Good to have you here. Uh, they want me to add DMPI. So antitrust is going to get a little bit volatile here. Google's been through it before. Um, Facebook has not. Amazon's most likely going to get hit as well. Amazon, for those who like to track Amazon, trade it. The majority of the internet traffic, a big lion's share of it, gets transferred through Amazon's AWS. So that gives them a lot of internet power, and it gives them a lot of data that they can use for marketing. And so they're most likely going to get looked at because Amazon's kind of branching into everything, and the government doesn't like it when your company branches into everything. There's a reason why Nestle can't own sugar fields can't own a lot of sugar fields. There's a reason why Nestle's chocolate, um, Mars, but Mars is not really a publicly traded company. There's a reason why they can't own sugar fields and sell candy at the same time because of antitrust. So if you are a data company like Amazon, you're selling products physically and digitally, you're transferring through advertising, you're doing internet traffic, you have your own shipping yards. That's when the government kind of steps in is if you are a a target like company on the internet and you're offering shipping that's kind of monopolistic and they don't like that so Amazon most likely to be the one to kind of watch on top of Facebook with that being said though these are the stocks we're gonna look at today we're gonna look at the SPY the IWM for our two indexes we're gonna look at Facebook Amazon Apple Google Microsoft we're gonna look at our post earnings plays for uh, Netflix Tesla PayPal AT&T we're gonna talk about Verizon who has earnings on the First, we're going to look at TLT, the VIX, Caterpillar, AMD, Shop, Squarespace, and DMPI, and then we'll wrap for the day. So, let's go take a look at the overall indexes and see how they're performing. As I said, they are down because of antitrust today. They were up pretty good, hitting all-time highs here recently, and you can see almost every sector is down today. There's not really one green sector outside of healthcare, and healthcare is only up because of retracement. Remember, Johnson & Johnson has a huge lawsuit currently going against them with asbestos in baby powder. Also, they have lawsuits against them because of opioids. So, kind of be careful here on Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, you can trade it for a day or two, but long-term holds, just be very careful because of those two lawsuits. Uh, asbestos in baby powders, powder is a pretty big deal, and that lawsuit's most likely going to be settled for a lot of money after insurance providers step in to pay a, a portion of that risk premium. Um, the one thing about asbestos is it never leaves your body once it's inside of it. And so uh, it's a cancer that kind of spreads, but it takes 20 to 30 years for it to develop. So usually the babies from 20, 30 years ago that had that talcum powder, there is a probable chance that they're, they're going to start showing signs of mesothelioma, which is asbestos cancer, if that is the fact there was asbestos in the talcum powder. And if they develop the cancer, that's usually the cancers they're going to develop is the mesothelioma, which is asbestos lung cancer. It's also what my dad passed away from, from asbestos. Healthcare is also going to be a pretty big political talking point, so be very careful if you're investing in uh, healthcare. It can change day to day. Whoever, whatever talking head talks about it that day. It's going to be a pretty wild ride this next year. You can see our industrials are kind of mixed here. You can see the UTX and Raytheon are up. Boeing getting hit again because of the 737 MAX issues. Really, if I was Boeing CEO, I would just ground all the 737 MAXs, fix the nose cone problem, and just signal that right away. Just ground the whole fleet and fix that problem. Yeah, they can fix it through software, but you want to get this problem resolved, just do it mechanically. Yes, you have to remove the nose cones to fix this issue, but look at how much the stock has moved since the 737 MAX problem. They could have just fixed it and had that problem resolved by now. It could have been done and their stock could have recovered, but that's not the case. 
they're still kind of dragging their heels on it. I would give this inept management just when it comes to fixing this problem. We are on a descending wedge here and it is looking like it's breaking down. So be very careful in Boeing's. Boeing also is dragging the Dow down pretty heavily today. If you're wondering who is um, dragging each index down, you can see it's Boeing. Boeing's really the big red mover today in the Dow. Boeing, I believe, had earnings and the earnings weren't great. Yeah, their earnings right there. You can actually see negative earnings there, so pretty bad. It's very rare for um, Boeing to post negative earnings. We could probably go back as far as we can go. We're going to go max available. We're going to go on a weekly because we really only need to see the earnings there. And you can see it's been a long, long time since Boeing has posted negative earnings. You can see right there. It's been um, 2009 was the last time that they posted negative earnings on Boeing. So it's been about 10 years, about a decade. Let's see here. It's going to be uh, right there. And it's going to be at the first of the year in 2009. So it's been a while. There we go there. Let's see here. Go back, back down. For some reason, this page right here just doesn't like to minimize with it. So just be careful on Boeing here. Let's go back and look at our heat map. Look at the overall heat map. Facebook down, leading tech down pretty heavily. Our semiconductors getting hit. Our NVIDIA's. Financials are all right across the board. Even our Wells Fargo is down. So it's kind of a red day today. You can see some outliers like Netflix retracing, UPS getting a little bit of a pump here. Um, our train's doing okay. But for the most part, most indexes, most sectors are down today. So just keep in mind, telecoms being kind of a, a the outlier for the uh, retracement there. You can see AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint and CTL are all up. So that's probably the one sector that you want to keep a watch for. Can you show me how to use the standard deviation indicator in order to find it? Are you talking about... Let's see here. I can show you that. So you're looking for the probability cone right here. This probability cone is this, is what I'm talking about for standard deviation. This is a, uh, this probability cone is a two standard deviation. This one is a three standard deviation. And to find that, if you are using Thinkorswim, you just go to Studies, you go to Add Studies right there, and you go to P, and you go to let's see here, probability of expiring cone. You just click on that, you know, add it right there. You can see you just add it there. And if you want to edit it. You just right click it, edit study, and you can edit the probability expiring cone. You can see I have two there. That's because I just added that one. Period will be the amount of candlesticks that you have in it. Typically I like to keep it where it is at 35, but if you like a 41 day candlestick, that's fine. Or 21 day candlestick, you can use that as well. Even a 14 day and 7 day, you can use all those. For probability range, we use the 68. The 68 is the standard, the one standard deviation move. The next one is going to be 95, and the next one after that is 99. And then it's like 127. But I hardly ever use a four standard deviation, so if I'm wrong in that one, uh, don't hold it against me. You can see right there. So you can just change that. So if you wanted to use your two standard deviation, you go right there to your 95. And you just save as default. And there you go. And we're now at our two standard deviation. Now say you're you don't have the ability to use Thinkorswim, but you have the access to Bollinger Bands, you can use Bollinger Bands as well for standard deviation. In Wall Street, we actually have the Bollinger Bands you can use right here. The Bollinger Bands are the standard deviation as well. If you ever wonder what these bands right here are, let's remove all these drawings. Let's clear all these drawings. We're going to look at Facebook. So these are the Bollinger Bands. Bollinger Bands, they compress and they expand. Usually when they compress, that tells you there's consolidation. When they expand, that tells you the price is moving way outside the 14-day moving average, which is this line right here. And then the outside bands are typically a two standard deviation of that 
14 day moving average and if we wanted to edit that we just go right here we go to our indicators and you can see I already had the Bollinger Band up and say we wanted a 21 day period so it's going to look at 21 days and we can use a three standard deviation we can use a four standard deviation five standard deviation let's make it simple and let's use the one standard deviation now we can use a simple moving average we can use exponential or we can use a double exponential I like to keep it simple so we go there and we used a 21 day Bollinger Band with a one standard deviation which is 68 percent uh, price movement and we can go look at right there and you can see that we're well outside the bands Typically for Bollinger Bands, you want to use at least a two or a three day standard deviation. There you go. As it gives you a little bit better compression. So you can use that too if you want to, if you don't have access to probability of expiring cone and think or swim and you want to just use the Wall Street IO charts, you can kind of use the Bollinger Bands as a, as a little bit of a cheater method for it. Now it's not going to give you the probability expiring way out here but it will show you where a two standard deviation is of that moving average that you're currently using inside those bands so you can use it that way too if you want so what's the ratings for your pink, less pink cone this cone right here so I use a 35 day with a 95 right there. That's all it is. If I want to use a 99, uh, the three standard deviation move, I can use that. Let's make it a little bit easier to see. We're going to make it this ugly blue. There we go. Let's see if it'll actually change it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It looks like it's not going to work for me. One thing about this probability of expiring cone, um, sometimes it will crash your platform. It will crash Tinkerswim every once in a while. But I, I use the same same settings. I use the 35 day. I use the 35 day period, and I use the probability range of 99. Now you can change if you want to make it uh, bullying. You can make the draw style if you want to make it look like this. You want to make it look like there, but you can't really change that. If you want to make it width, you want to make it a little bit thicker. You can. There you go. Let's see if it actually works. And you can see right there. Makes it really hard to see, but it gives you the ranges to look at too. If you ever wanted to do that, let's go change that back. You know, you can change it. Value is high, value is low. You can use it right there. There's lots of settings you can change. There you go. You can change the bottom in too. But for me, I like to keep it real simple because it's one, it's easier on my eyes. Two, uh, it doesn't blow up. <laughs> I don't have to re go back to uh, my save workspace and re-adjust re uh, it from there. So I like to keep it as, kind of as easy as possible. But you can change a whole bunch of settings here. The upper part of the curve, you can change the lower part of the curve. You can see right there, you can change the downward plot if you want to. Upper probability, downward probability. If you wanted to do an upper probability of the 99 you want to do the downward probability of maybe a 68 you could do that if you wanted to so you could change both the upper and uh, lower probability understand that sometimes it doesn't work it's not it's not perfect but it'll give you a good idea where it's gonna move when I mean it doesn't work sometimes it won't adjust another thing to think about when it comes to this probability cone is when there is big price movement the cone will look wide so let's go take a look at that real quickly. Let's see here. We need a really big stock that moved just horrifically the last couple days. You can see we don't even have it in Tesla. Oh, there we go. You see how the cone is really compressed to the put side, but really wide to the call side or to the upside? That's because there's a big price discrepancy right now. So when you see these types of movements, be kind of wary entering your long there. That tells you that the prices are really wide and there's kind of a more of a risk. Um, there's a potential risk to a gap up more than there is a potential gap down. So be very careful when you see these wide, wide movements here. You want your cones to kind of be nice and even both sides. So be very careful with this one. We'll, we'll talk about Tesla a little bit more. Hopefully that covered the probability cone in depth for you. Um, remember it could crash your all your other settings so before you put this probability cone on and you have a lot of settings that you want to keep just go over to thinkorswim 
again this is one to close here and there's this little cog right here on your home page we're going back to our monitor trade skip page we go to this little cog in the up you see my mouse here on the up upward left hand panel right there and we can load defaults we can save our pages and where we want right oh sorry setup we go to setup and we can save our workspace so go right there you want to save your workspace so we'll call it um Catherine spelled it wrong 725209 so we save our workspace right there so in case the probability clone does crash it because sometimes it will we can just load up that workspace before we put those cones on put those cones on and then we can save our workspace to something new and so we'll have all our settings saved in two different places so you could do that as well So hopefully that answered as much as I can about the probability of expiring cone. Those prices right there are just the prices of the standard deviations of where they'll be at at that time. You can see at 920, 816. Now, why are there prices right there and nowhere else? Those are option expiration dates. Those red lines right there, those are when options expire for that month. And so the probability cone kind of uses probability of expiring in the options. So... That's why it has prices right there, right on the option expiration date. 816 will be August expirations. 920 will be September's expirations. So if you're wondering what the red line's there and why there's only price numbers right there on top of that line, that's why. If you're wondering what this is right here that I keep closing, I have a piece of, uh, I was rendering art, so... And I didn't want to close it because it took me a long time to get this right there. So let's go take a look at some charts here. Hopefully that, that did answer for you, Catherine. So let's go back to the S&P 500. So how will we trade the S&P 500? Well, right now we're in the middle of earnings. Tonight we have Google and Amazon. Both those are big beta weight in the market. And both of them seems a little bit of risk today because of antitrust lawsuits getting drafted or just the exploration of antitrust suits. Now, are we going to do short options here on the SPY? Well, can we do short options is the question. You can always sell volatility if you want to, but is it a good idea right now is the question. And my risk profile tells me not. It is not a good idea because at 12% implied volatility percentage, and implied volatility kind of sitting right here on the lows, there's not a lot of vega in these options to sell. Really, when you're looking at the SPY, you're looking at either long stock, short stock, long options, and a little bit of your debit spreads. You're not really looking at credit spreads. You're not really looking at cash secured puts. You're not looking at covered calls. Covered calls will be a little bit less risky, but because Vega is slow, so low here, selling premium wouldn't be the best idea for the SPX. It's relatively low because we are, we've already had about 75% of all earnings have been reported, which were better than expected on the majority of them. So volatility is going to get crushed from there. We are entering the summer doldrums where a lot of traders set things on automatic as they go to vacation before kids go back to school. We're getting close to the dog days of summer, as they call them, which it's called the dog days of summer because the dog star is going, the dog star is going to be the brightest in the sky when it comes this time of year. The dog star is serious, and so if you ever wonder why they call it the dog days, that's why the dog the dog star serious is going to be the brightest in the sky next to Polaris, which is the North Star, and typically volume starts to decline here and the chance of a market surprise really starts to pick up because there's low volume and low volume typically you will have a little bit more volatility and yes i did just say volatility is low so if we are going to be if there is a higher risk of a surprise movement in the market to the potential downside or upside increasing volatility you don't want to be short volatility into that is what i'm saying so right now we are testing trying to retest highs here we're big into earnings going into today and apple next week short volatility would not be the greatest play here but if you wanted to do it say if your risk profile says hey, i'm going to sell volatility anyhow even though it's not the greatest ideas 
there is some premium to extract here. You know, your five deltas, your six deltas. You can make like 38 cents, 41 cents at a six delta. You want to keep it below 15. You can see that puts us at 288, 15 delta. I use 15 delta because usually once you start getting to your 15s and your 20 strikes, there are deltas. Margin typically goes up in different accounts. So I usually like to keep it below 15. At 93 cents, at 200, at 287 is a little bit risky for me, but there is premium if you did want to sell it. Though Vega is kind of low, and if we actually go look at the implied volatility, right here we're gonna look at implied volatility right there so we're looking at the 287 you can see it's at 14 percent if it goes up just one percent you're gonna be adding 20 cents theoretically to that option so if volatility picks up from 14 to 15 to 16 you're gonna be adding about three dollars of Vega here which is 20 uh, 40 60 cents which is going to be a lot of margin increase for one, two. It's going to add a lot more time than which you can get out of that trade. And you might be saying, well, Jake, what if volatility collapses here? Well, theoretically, it should go down 20 cents each time, but 14% implied volatility is, is light. It's really light implied volatility. I could go to 10% volatility, and that would take about 80 cents out of these options, and that would be good for this position, but again, there's a little bit more risk to the upside here because 14% implied volatility is really low for the S&P 500. It's exceptionally low. I mean, if we go, to go look at the VIX, the VIX is at 12.73, which is the VIX is the call to put ratio spread of the 30-day out S&P 500 future contracts. And anytime it's below 14, around that 12 level tells us that it's not optimal time to sell premium. So just keep that in mind but if you did want to do it there is premium to extract here just be careful of vega expansion and i did look at the 22 day out options you could look at maybe like the 29 day out options if you want just keep in mind that you want to keep it a little bit less time than more time for the s p 500. isn't there a better way to, for the market to sell off and sell at the money puts isn't it better to wait for the market to sell off and sell yes it is better for the market to sell off and then sell uh, sell at the money puts Oof, that's kind of risky there if the market's selling off and you sell at the money puts you're going to be um if you sell at the money puts and the market sells off it's not you're going to be potentially underwater in that trade i just use the put side i mean we could look at the call side as well but if we look at the same delta, so we look at a delta 14, that puts you about a 307, um, 308, the comparable premium. You can see the 308, and that puts us about an $8 move. If we go look at the 387, that puts us at a $13 move there. So the premium is a little bit fatter on the put side. That's all, that's all I was trying to get. That's why I was using the put side over the call side. But typically, you want to sell premium when the, after the market sells off or after a time of high volatility. I was just using an example. If you just wanted to sell volatility, even though it's not a good idea, letting you know there is some Vega to extract here, but that would not be an optimal trade. Typically, the trades to look at when volatility is low is you look at your long voltage, uh, Vega trades, trades that will typically do well when Vega expands. You could look at your covered calls if you think volatility is going to be neutral because the covered call is a neutral play here. Typically, you want to be range bound for that. And your debit spreads do a little bit better than your credit spreads. So those are trades you want to look at. But again, I said if your roast profile is different than mine and you're going to sell uh, short options anyhow, there is some premium, but I would not recommend it at this time for the S&P 500. Next up, let's go take a look at the IWM. Now, the IWM is coming down today. It looks like it's actually the market's moving pretty well right now. The IWM is relatively flat. Remember when I said that it's going to crash your system? It's always not. It's always kind of wonky. Remember when we looked at Facebook and we only saw two of these bars? Now, look, at we now have four. So that's what I was getting out the probability expiring cone. It's not always the most... Um, 
it's a little bit wonky. And you can hear that, so it begins, the kids have come. Looking at the, the Russell right now, the Russell is pretty range bound. Looking at between the 158 and right here the 153. So we're at about a $5 movement. Its ADR is about 1.86, so we're looking at about a $2 movement here, and our range is 158 to 152, so we have about 3 ATR, um, 52, yeah, we have about 2 to 3 ADR, ATRs of range here. We're at the top in that range, so that's pretty good. Uh, it is looking neutral, though, range-wise. You can see we have yet to cross above here this 158. The Russell, unlike the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, looks it's pretty range bound. It's pretty stuck here. So it hasn't participated in the all-time highs that the Dow has, that the S&P 500 has. It's kind of stuck here. And the reason why it's stuck is because trade agreements with China, um, it's really weighing it down. Also, because the Federal Reserve is currently dovish on interest rates. It's dovish on interest rates, so that's typically not good for the financial sectors, particularly the smaller to mid-cap banks. When interest rates are lowered, it makes it harder for them to make an income. The big banks don't care. The big banks will make a lot of revenue because they just have a lot of transactions. The smaller banks really, they kind of need those higher interest rates to make a little bit more profit. And so by the, the central bank saying we're going to cut rates once again, not too bullish for the financial index or the financial sector of the, the Russell, which is the biggest sector in it. Looking at implied volatility, we're at 12% implied volatility, so not again great on the indexes here. I promise you we will look at some volatility here in a moment. Just going to run through the whole chart here. Um, selling volatility, now you can see we are about 3% higher in the IWM. Typically the IWM and the QQQs will have the highest volatility of the indexes. And again, same thing holds true for the S&P 500. You're not looking at your short option plays here. You're looking at your debit spreads, your long options and your maybe a covered call here if you think the range bound is going to continue for the IWM. But yes, you may say, well, Jake, isn't a cash secured put the same risk profile as a covered call? The answer is yes, it is. A naked put has the same risk profile as a covered call, if you didn't know that. So you could look there, but you don't typically want to be naked options right now, so there's a little bit more risk to that, that naked position than there is to the covered call because the covered call is backed by stocks. And so the, the surprises that could happen during this time of year, I would kind of avoid that naked put for now. If it is a cash secured naked put, meaning that there is money behind it to buy the stocks, that's okay if you're looking for a better order entry here. But I would be very careful keeping my naked put or my cash secured put at the 152, I'd maybe look at maybe like the 144s and lower for the IWM because of the range bound. Actually, a little bit more optimal would be like the 145s. And if you could get it, even though we're in a time of low volatility, the 125s, I highly doubt you can get a 125 with 30 days left to go with a good premium. But let's go take a look at it real quick. Let's go look at a 27 day out, or was 29 day out, 122s. Yeah, you can you can't get premium on it right now. You'll be lucky to get good premium at um, the 144s. So just keep that in mind. Doesn't look too great for the indexes. The index is kind of boring right now. Slow grind to the top. Slow grind to test resistance again. The IWM is definitely not leading the pack here. It's the S&P 500. The, even the NASDAQ is not, lead, uh, is not picking up like the S&P 500. You can see, the, yes, the NASDAQ is making all-time highs here, but it's really all about the S&P. Now, you can see we're at 10% implied volatility, so really low compared to the S&P 500 by 2%, which is kind of abnormal. You don't typically see the NASDAQ have lower, uh, S lower IV percentage than the S&P 500. And you can see right there, the actual implied volatility shows, yes, that's in fact the, the NASDAQ has 2% higher implied volatility. So just keep that in mind. Let's see here. What options tell you Facebook is it dropped almost 12 bucks from high? That's a good question, Catherine. Hopefully I answered that for you. Uh, what the options tell you about Facebook, it dropped almost 12 bucks from the high. It's nuts. Uh, options, they really can't tell you a price there. They can just tell you um, the Greeks can help you with that, but it won't tell you when a stock is potentially going to drop. That's more of a seasonality thing. Facebook, though, 
if let's go look at Facebook real quick, had good earnings. I went through all the earnings through, um, in a little bit in depth yesterday at the market recap. So if you want to go review that video, you can. I looked at the numbers. We looked at the advertising growth, and they're paying more for clicks in the United States. We saw that the more profitable sector, the United States and Canada, is starting to slow down in growth. It actually contracted previous quarters now it's back to that area all the growth is coming from northern pacific area areas so we're really only seeing growth in asia we're not really seeing growth in north america and europe which is their bread and basket uh, bread and butter really where they make the most revenue so with the guidance too from the from the cfo i believe it doesn't look good for the stock when they say the profits are going to be potentially cut here remember facebook has a spectacular management team and so when they say that profits are potentially going to be a little bit lower, you should curb your um, enthusiasm a little bit. They're pretty spot on. Their management team is pretty solid in Facebook. Is the 46th brightest star. Very cool. No, that's not a new moot point. That's a good point. I like me some stars. Actually, my mom bought us a refractor telescope, and the last couple nights I've been taking the kids out, and we've been looking at the moon, and Saturn has been really close to Earth, and you're able, you're barely able to see it now, but you're able to see the moons floating around it. We were able to see four moons uh, last night, just very tiny little spots. It's been pretty cool. So, going back to uh, Facebook. The range is kind of consolidated here. Typically, Facebook will gap up, move higher, and the range will move sideways. You can see we tried to move up today, failed to do so, and we went all the way back to the 197. Now, revenue was really good. It should have added to the value of the stock. And you can see because of the antitrust lawsuits and because of the fines they paid here, it contracted back down to this range. I would keep a watch right here for the 207.50 to break and then look for the 208 potentially 209 is the next area of resistance. Now, remember, we are using a 21-day Bollinger Band with a two-standard deviation. The three-standard deviation move, if we do change that real quick, the three-standard deviation supports a movement all the way up to the 213. So I'd call that a little bit of the high for Facebook. Now, short options, again, wouldn't be recommended on Facebook because the volatility crush today. After earnings, typically volatility comes down. You can see right there our earnings were pretty good. They beat expectations by almost three cents, so not bad there. But it's really about politics right now that's driving the stock here. So I would keep a close eye on those ranges. I'd be very careful shorting implied volatility here because after the earnings, we get a volatility crush, and then usually Facebook doesn't return there. So if you are short options today, I would definitely start looking for the exits. Maybe taking a little bit of profitability, but understand that it's probably going to crush a little bit more tomorrow going into Friday. So keep that in mind for Facebook. We're at 21% implied volatility percentage, and we're looking at currently 28 implied volatility, and 24 looks to be where it stops at. So you're looking about maybe a 4% movement in, in uh, Vega. So there's a little bit more juice to extract if you are short those options through earnings, which bold decision to short uh, Facebook options into its earnings, but your risk profile is different than mine. You have about 4% more Vega to go before it bottoms out, but I would start looking to take my profits today on Facebook. You can see overall that two-minute chart. You can see a lot of whipsaw earlier on. You can see almost the point where the CFO said that, hey, profits aren't going to be looking as great as normal, and you can see the return the next day, and you can see the dip right there uh, once the market absorbed that news of the antitrust. You can see right there, we are consolidating right on that 198.50. If that pierces down below, I kind of keep a watch for yesterday's movement right there. And we're looking at a potential movement right if it breaks that consolidation, pretty sharp moving back down to the 196. So we are forming a little bit of a daily wedge right now. Be careful if you're looking to long entry on Facebook. The next movement I would look at is if it can recapture that 199.200 mark. If you're going to do an order entry. Next up, let's see how I'm doing in time here. I probably went through a little, bit, yeah, a little bit longer than I thought I did. Let's go, um, let's go take a look at our earnings stocks real quick. They're going to look at Netflix to see how Netflix recovered. We'll get Tesla, Pe uh, Tesla, PayPal, 
AT&T, and then we're going to cover Caterpillar, AMD, Shop, Squarespace, and then look at DMPI, and then we'll potentially wrap today. Looking at Netflix, Netflix had its earnings last week, and it is recovering here slowly. We did have a big gap down here. This gap is not filled here. We had a nice sell-off, and then we had a pivot a little bit higher. You can see right there that 328, 330, it is struggling to return here. If it does pierce above here, and we see a nice price movement to the upside, look for 336. Our histogram of the MACD is two green candlesticks the last couple days, but the moving averages are pretty wide, so no order sig uh, signal yet. Volume, we had nice green stick volume here with volume ascending, which I would keep a watch for tomorrow to see if volume will return higher. If volume is returning higher, typically when we have ascending, or ascending volume testing a potential area of resistance going into a weekend, it will typically follow through the next day. So you want to keep a watch for that for Netflix. Netflix's earnings were not bad. Uh, they did add 2.7 million more subscribers, so about 26 million, 27 million dollars a month in revenue. But they did say that they are going to be losing a lot of their flagship con flagship content going uh, into the future here, and they're losing Disney content with a lot of other streaming services starting to just pop up all over the place. Netflix has to build a moat some way to where they can have content that drives eyeballs again and it's going to be difficult for uh, Netflix but then again they have something like 30 plus million subscribers and if you just do the simple math there 9 million we'll round it up to 10 million uh, we'll round it up to $10 a month for most subscribers so $10 a month 30 million subscribers that's $300 million a month in cash flow they do have some cash flow right now to adjust things but they have a lot of debt so that should be my worry for Netflix. A lot, a lot of debt. They're one of the biggest movers of um, triple B and lower high yield debt. They issue a lot of corporate debt to fund their projects. So that's my run risk there. It's a nice little pivot return here. I'd keep a watch for a movement above 328 and then I look for the return to the 335. Stochastics is a little bit oversold here, still kind of weak in Stochastics, so it tells us there is a potential continuation to rise back to the 50 line. But again, I would take, I would keep a watch for one volume and two of this price point, 32.50, if it can rise up here. Volatility, volatility is kind of light for Netflix because remember last week was its earnings, and so volatility is kind of crushed. Though we are currently sitting at 30% implied volatility, so not too bad. But you can see right there we are currently sitting at the lows. Of the year for implied volatility so you can potentially get in a little bit better price for your short options right now at 18 percent implied volatility next up let's go take a look at tesla tesla had earnings last night and they were horrific tesla missed on pretty much every top end bottom end car delivery they had a pretty bad quarter there's just no way of getting around it tesla had a pretty miserable quarter they missed on Car deliveries this quarter. They missed on top end production. They missed in low end production. They missed all around. This was just a straight miss for Tesla. Now, when you're a growth company, not every quarter is going to be great here. And you can see Tesla has a history of having really bad quarters. Now, they did talk about they're getting closer to be self fully self funded, which, um, no, they're not anywhere near close to being self funded, unless you mean self funded is in issuing debt, because Tesla issues a lot, a lot of debt, and they also issue a lot of convertible bonds, and they issue debt that's uh, kind of wonky, to say the least. I believe they issued some corp, uh, convertible bonds this last time, and they only got something like 30% of the value of those bonds brought back into their coffers. It was a terrible deal for Tesla, but they need capital. They need working capital really, really bad. Now, we did gap down about 12%, oh, almost 14% today. Tesla likes to continue to uh, drop here. One thing I keep in mind in Tesla, you can see right there, that absolute huge drop today. Uh, Tesla will typically find support around the 220, 227 is where they typically like to move around. Tesla also has a huge short float. So for those looking to short Tesla, it's a hard to borrow stock. You can't typically get shares to short it really easy you can see there's fundamentals right here i can show you that 
you can see it's currently sitting at 31%. So that tells us every um, third share sharing, uh, every third share trading on the floor for S for Tesla, it's currently traded short. So it's kind of hard to borrow here. Typically, the play for Tesla is watch it drop below 220, look at get back to the 180s, and then look for the short covering to happen, and you ride that short covering. So we're not there yet for the short covering, but keep a watch for it. Um, it does look like it has a little bit of support right there, the two, about the 217. But the typical play for Tesla is you wait for it to get back to 270, and then you look for your short entry, you short it, wait for the drop below 200, look for about the 180, and then you look to long it from the short covering. And you can see right here this long little upward movement here, short covering. It gets pretty volatile around that time. So Tesla's a wait and see. But just wanted to bring up, the quarter was horrific. That was not a good quarter at all. And all auto industries really didn't have a great quarter either. Ford had a good, um, Ford did not have a good earnings. Ford had earnings out today, I believe, before the market. And you can see they miss as well. The auto industry is having, oh, it's after the market. For, the auto industry is not having a good time right now. Um, pretty much everyone that has a car got a car in the last couple of years here and they're all under five to seven year contracts now so if you're looking at GM I would be kinda of careful longing GM to this quarter after Tesla and Ford missed so that's a long way of saying if you've t uh, been profitable on GM from 33 maybe it'd be a good time to start evaluating buying a long put to protect this trade or maybe look to adjust your stops here. Yes, GM is rounding up pretty nicely, but with the quarter Ford and Tesla both had, just be very careful holding on to this long going into earnings. That earnings being uh, on the first here, and the first is going to be right there on Thursday. So be very careful here. Might not be a bad time to start looking at buying a put for protection. You are going to be buying a put at a premium though, so maybe just keep your shop uh, your stops tight, or maybe look to take a little bit of profit off the table for this automaker for GM. Next up, let's go take a look at PayPal. Now, is there any questions so far? Any questions, comments, concerns? Any options you'd like me to look at in particular? If not, I'll just continue on the list here. Next up, PayPal. PayPal actually didn't have a bad quarter. PayPal beat on expectations, but their guidance was pretty soft. And you can see, look at that huge move up and then huge move back down today. Typically, this is why you don't want to hold long positions into earnings of growth companies when they miss. You can see it moved all the way down from 122 at 1.2. It moved down to 112. Pretty big move. It did recover today back to the 117, but from yesterday's close at the, around the 122 to 116, that was a pretty significant drop. PayPal, once again, is struggling with companies like Spotify and Vimeo and Cash App. What this thing is just distracting me. And just close that. There we go. So PayPal is still struggling with other cash providers here and it is starting to ray on their bottom line. They did find support the 11350, which is a good sign that they did find support. We can see that there's a nice buy side volume today. And I would keep a watch for the 116, the potential to 118. Now, Stochastics did sell off pretty hard, and the histogram, the MACD is no real help here. Look for a return to this 14-day moving average for a potential order entry for PayPal. Remember, the earnings quarters wasn't too particularly bad. They did post good revenue growth. They did uh, did post some good earnings numbers, so you might be able to get this stock a little bit cheaper here. I definitely keep a watch for this area of resistance, the 11350, if that does break down. Well, watch out below. It's going to potentially move down to this one. Ooh, one, 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 one. That's pretty funny. For PayPal. Next up, let's go take a look at AT&T. Now, AT&T we covered last uh, last week and what I planned on doing for this trade. I was expecting the one thir uh, 3180 to hold. But if it didn't, my price targets were about 131 uh, and, and 30. Now, AT&T did post some good earnings here. Interesting thing about at and So when we look at Facebook, we can see they make about $58 billion in sales a year. Let's go take a look at what at and does. at and makes about $177 billion in sales. So they make a lot of they make a lot of cash and they do bring about 10% home. They don't bring about the uh, 
they don't bring as much revenue home as Facebook does but they make a lot of money now their quarter wasn't bad nice growth the Time Warner deal is still producing good results but the cord cutters are still cutting cords you can see that they lost 773,000 subscribers this year huge huge subscribers lost but the revenue wasn't bad and so the stock retraced you can see you got hit with a nice upgrade today so it's continuing to perform here AT&T will typically sell off into its dividend which it did here and we got a nice bounce after earnings I wasn't expecting the movement this fast back up to 33 typically I like to wait to um, typically I like to take profit after the 32 but you can see we're looking to move all the way back to the 34 the time Warner deal the stock should be about a $40 stock after that merger and it's been pretty depressed for a long time nice little oversold rally here you can see it was pretty oversold in stochastics right here and we did bounce up after earnings I was gonna wait until after earnings to potentially play this company uh, as it's struggling to move above 33.85, uh, I will wait until we get confirmation above 34, and then 34 you can potentially look at the 34, 36, and above there we have to go pretty far back, and we can see the last time that it was this high, right here. The next price move it looks to be about the 35 for AT&T, but pretty good earnings here. Yes, they are still losing subscribers for their Dish Network. And yes, it's going to hurt their bottom line, but they're going, to, they're going to try to pivot to their own type of mobile device. And I do think software is going to be more important than hardware. And AT&T does have the infrastructure to broadcast all that software. So I do think that the stock has some value. Um, it is a little bit more of a value stock here. You can see that it's book per share value. We're a little bit high from there, and the P.E. ratio is pretty good. So I do see some upside, more upside potential for AT&T. And we did hold this upward range too. Now, if you're going to sell premium AT&T, it's hard to do. It's rather difficult to sell premium AT&T unless you're doing significant amount of shares. You can see right here at the money options, you look at 34. You're looking to get 31 cents at 29 days out here. It's really difficult to sell premium here. I would probably look for sell like this 20 set, this 33 here. Do maybe a cash secured put and wait to get in there. Maybe wait for a little bit of retracement in AT&T and then get into the strike here. But until then, um, that it went up a lot faster than I thought it would after earnings. I was not expecting that such a huge spike. I was expecting maybe a little bit of a pivot back to the 32, and it absolutely crushed it to the 33.30. And it's looking like it's going to retest this 38 and maybe retest that 34 rather quickly. I would like to get in back in around the 32. Right there, I'd like to get back in there. Um, Option-wise, the 32 puts me about 12 cents. Remember, looking for the money strikes here, it's kind of hard. Whew, gotta go quick here. So next up, let's go take a look at Caterpillar, AMD, Shopify, and then we'll wrap for the day. Uh, Squarespace SQ. Yep, that's right. Yeah, AT&T is a good one to hold an IRA. Long-term hold, three investing dividend. That's a good way to go for that company. I have that in my kids' retirement. All right, my my kids' college fund. That is a good stock to own. Ooh, my foot fell asleep. One second here. Yeah, AT&T, Verizon, um, Philip Morris, and Altera Group have been harder and harder to trade because of regulations with e-cigarettes, but. AT&T and Verizon are a pretty solid reinvest dividend play because they both pay a high dividend and they have a lot of sales and they own a lot of properties that would, if AT&T and Verizon were to go under, we'd have a whole internet issue. Actually, we're going to cover um, shop real quick and then we'll wrap for the day because my kids are screaming. And then we'll cover those um, off the channel here in a little bit so looking at Shopify Shopify is moving back to the three uh, 336 it is starting to gear up to be the competitor for Amazon which will be actually good for Amazon to have a competitor in the United States um, yes there is Baba you can use Alibaba if you want to but Shopify is starting to grow here and it's getting really competitive with it Shopify is a pretty 
high P.E. ratio company. So keep that in mind. Remember when I talked about high P.E. ratio, high growth companies, when they miss expectations on earnings, what happens to them? They typically crater really, really quickly. That's one thing you got to watch out for Shopify. You can see the high P.E. ratio there. They don't make a lot of sales here, and they're not that big quite yet. I mean, they make $1.18 in sales. Amazon made that today within the first trading hour. That's how much money Amazon can make. I mean, let's go look at Amazon here. $241 billion in sales. So they make a lot of money too. I like Shopify. I think Shopify has good potential. I know a lot of small restaurants here in town. They use Shopify. Shirt providers, a lot of small entrepreneurs are using Shopify here. You can see we do have earnings coming up on eight oh um next week, so be kind of careful here. This company, let's see if this company does follow implied volatility waves. Not really. Um, it does have earnings growth here, so kind of be careful here in Shopify. 32% implied volatility. I'd be kind of careful here at right now looking to long the company just because of how close it is to earnings. It doesn't look like much of a straddle play or strangle play. Um, yeah, I would wait. Nice uptrend, though, that we're still in. The channel is still holding. Let's go take a look here at the channel for Shopify. Still a nice bullish channel here. Kind of getting a little bit more wonky in that range. I would keep a watch for a breakout of 335 for a continuation rise at 352. And a movement back down to 320. So you're looking at a pretty wide range here. We're currently sitting at all-time highs at 338. And 324. It's pretty tight. Um, eight, what is the ATR of this company? Eleven dollars. Wow. This this oof, that thing can move. Eleven dollars up. Three thirty eight and three twenty four. So that puts us about an ATR and a half. Huh. Uh, it does look like it's testing resistance right now. If it breaks out here, if the ATR is eleven dollars, so three thirty eight, that'll put us at three forty eight. Would be the next area to look at. Yeah, be careful here. Earnings next week. Um, Option-wise, you're going to have to keep it less than seven days or be at least out of the stock in the next seven days because of where it's at in earnings-wise. Wow, look at that premium. That is a lot. That is flush with premium. Holy cow. Three ninety, I can get a dollar. Wow. And a delta of eight. Uh, the bid ask spread's a little bit wide. What if there's an open interest here? Uh, not that big of open interest. Let's go check at the put side. Where can we get a dollar at? 280. 280 puts us at a probably like a 12 delta. No, 280 would probably put a. Yeah, I think about a 12 delta. 280, no, 6 delta, half that. Yeah, you could definitely sell premium here on Shopify. I understand it's still a $300 share company, um, and we are trading this into earnings, so be very careful in that. Also, with volatility being this high, good luck finding a good put protection here, cheap. Uh, if you're looking to maybe buy, protect your long position in the stock, it might not be a bad idea to maybe take a little bit of profit off the table. Keep a little bit on, let your winners rise, and keep a tight stop here. But, um, yeah, that put protection is going to be expensive. And this is eight days left. I mean, I wouldn't... 15 days... Uh, let's go 20... 15 days. No, it's not too bad. 280 is looking at like... Uh, 175. That's still good premium. Yeah, I like the premium here. How is the spread look here? Now you have me interested in what I can do with the spread here. Now, I'm not going to trade this company before earnings, but just look in the spread potential here. If there's actually a spread potential, like the 255s, 245s, that's a, big, that's a huge bid-ass spread. Uh, that's almost $10. That's still one ATR, though. Huh. Let's again look at this open interest. 
So there's open interest at the 250. So you can see that right there. There's currently 23 open positions held. And the 265 currently has 427 positions held. No volume today. Interesting. Can the stock gap on its earnings? Let's see if there's enough time to see if there is gaps on earnings. Not really. This is not a gap company. Hmm. This is interesting. Uh, volatility of 51%. That's a high volatility, though. That's um almost four times higher than the S&P 500. 14, almost 4.5. Yeah, but not bad premium. How are you currently trading Shopify? For those who are currently trading this company, how are you currently trading this? I'd like to know. That'd be interesting. Uh, ATR is pretty huge. It's gone up in the last week here, and that's probably due to the earnings coming out here due to the ATR moving up. A lot of people are getting in before earnings, but how are you currently trading Shopify? And it sounds like the kids have walked away from the door, so let's go cover um, Caterpillar real quick. But I can hear them outside my door. They're circling right now. I can hear it. <laughs> it's like I'm in a shark cage that has a giant hole in it, and the sharks are just waiting to come in at any time. Is it bad that I describe my kids as sharks? No, it's summertime. They want attention bad. So let's go take a look at Caterpillar real quick. We'll look at Caterpillar, and then we'll look at um, Squarespace, and then we'll wrap here. So Caterpillar did cite the problems with China. They are seeing growth slow, or they are seeing a little bit of slowdown in the global economy, in particular with China. The tariffs are hurting them. Their earnings weren't particularly great. They did miss on EPS, but they did actually make some earnings growth here. They weren't a, a complete miss. You can see they did miss by a wide wide margin, but it wasn't like negative one earnings. It wasn't half of what they should have been. So they did see some growth here. Um, they are up pretty good today. And you see right there, they had earnings after the mar or before the market, and you can see they've been kind of slowly grinding up here today. Caterpillar's not too bad. Um, Caterpillar is one of those indexes that you look for how the global economy is doing. When Caterpillar is not doing good, you know there's actually an industrial slowdown because they sell a lot of products. Let's go take a look here. 11% implied volatility. You're looking at a pure option play here. No, 25%. Uh, no, there's a little bit of option juice, but you can see in the last, since uh, April, we're currently sitting right at the lows of their Vega. So not a great time to sell options on caterpillar it's more of your long option times remember you're selling your higher you're selling your long options your long calls your long puts your debit spreads your long stock here maybe a covered call or two if we can identify a range but you're not looking at selling short options on caterpillar because of the low volatility looking at the overall range here you can see that we did find support right there at the 130 I had success buying in the money puts on T a week or so before the dividend. Oh, that's cool. All right, buying? Oh, buying in the money puts. That's great. Good job, 66MI. Did you spot that how typically uh, three of the last four times the dividend payout happens in 18T? It typically rides down. If you did spot that trend, congratulations. That's a smart trade. I like it. Uh, typically, when I buy long options, I buy time. So I typically buy, I like to buy at least 90 days or above. And the reason for 90 days or above is because the um, the theta curve. This is the theta curve. This is the theta time decay graph. Let's actually see if I can find the right one here. Right here. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. There we go. Let's make this a little small. There we go. Fit the screen there. So you can see 90 days, we have a pretty, we start seeing a little bit of sloping in theta, but we see a lot of sloping in data, 60 to 45 days. So I like to keep it at least three months and back just so theta won't start eating away. And you can see theta is increasing in time here. Optimal is 120 days plus, 
but again, you're buying a lot of time there. So I like to buy time when it comes to my long calls, my long puts. Plus, if it goes against me and say I wanted to get out of the trade, it gives me a little bit of time to adjust that trade for it to come back. And two, I can sell a short call against it with a, lot of, a little bit shorter of time, and I can reduce my cost to entry for those. Because remember, if I sell a, say, 120-day out long call, I can maybe sell like a 30-day, maybe maybe a 30-day or less long call and maybe cash flow out a little bit, do a poor man cover call there. So I typically like to buy time for my long options. Yeah, it's a smart trade, 66 in my Congratulations. I like to do 90 days plus on my long calls and my long puts because of the theta curve. It eats away in less options. The more time you, you can buy, the better. So if you're like in a 85 day out long call, just understand understand theta is going to start eating away at that long call. But I'm not saying if you want to only be in it for a day or two, maybe a week or maybe a week or two, you can look at your shorter time options. Just understand that the theta is going to decay or another. But if you're expecting a big move in that option, you can buy your shorter time options. Um, but you want to be out of it. A little bit sooner so you can swing trade it a day or two if you want but if you're looking for maybe a, it's going to take a week or two for it, it to potentially make that move you want to buy time you want to buy time let's see here for caterpillar um, option wise mm, 22 days out here uh, once caterpillar pays dividend Let's see here. I already paid its dividend. Okay, don't have to watch that. Ooh, a dollar dividend now? Uh, $134. Okay. Yeah, not bad. Let's go back to the range here. Sorry, I got distracted. Um, looking at the range here, I'd keep a watch for the 130.80 as the active area support. If it cannot hold this area, I'd keep the next movement down to the 126. You can see some pretty big sell volume yesterday. Earnings. Uh, if it recovers here, I keep a watch of recovery of the 14-day moving average. The 135 should be the next price target, and that should fill. Uh, we are actually we had a gap. No, not a gap fill would be 136. So we have about the 135, 134.70s, and a return to the 136. So those would be your two potential upside targets for t um, for Caterpillar. If it does dip down here, I'd keep a watch below this 130. This 130, you can see a long area of consolidation. We had about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven candlesticks inside of it, and you can see this area previous before. So if it fails to hold that area of resistance, you're looking right, or sorry, support, you're looking right there. But it doesn't look bad for Caterpillar. It does look like it wants to recover here. Um, our stochastics are right in the middle point, so no help here. And our histogram, the MACD, is not really helping as well. But again, it is post earnings. So keep that in mind. Last up, let's go take a look at Squarespace. I know I always try to keep this under an hour, but we're an hour and eight minutes. So let's look at Squarespace, and then we'll briefly talk about Amazon as we're looking at setting up Squarespace. Now, Amazon has earnings tonight. If you have a huge risk tolerance, say you just love risk, you can't get enough risk, Amazon has one of the most volatile earnings on the stock market, one of the big tech companies. Amazon can move. 10% easy after its earnings. At $200 per share, Amazon can move quickly. So if you are holding a long position on an Amazon going into tonight's earnings, be very careful. Be so careful because it could gap down 100 points, 150 points in a blink of an eye. You want to be very careful on this stock. Of all the Fameng stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix, Google. This is one of the most spectacular movers after the earnings reports in the after hours trading. It can move so quickly against you. This is one of the stocks that I would highly recommend not shorting into its earnings. This is very volatile. So if you are holding short options into Amazon's earnings, you better have a hedge or you better have a way to get out of that trade because it can go against you really poorly. So be very careful tonight on Amazon's earnings. That's one point I want to get across to everyone. Be very careful tonight on Amazon. It is 
one of the most volatile movers in its earnings, just like Netflix. Those are the two remaining stocks that I am, I usually, I will always sidelines myself and not trade into its earnings are those two, just because of the volatility. But again, that's my risk profile. Yours might be different than mine. Looking at Squarespace here, and we'll wrap up for the day here. Squarespace is in a nice tight range here between 78 and 82. Uh, right now, it does look like it's recovering. I would wait for either this candlestick to fill for an order entry, that being 81.60, or look for it to fail at the 77.55. If it does fail the 77.55, you're looking at a potential movement back down the 74.76. The stochastics are telling us that we're overbought. The histogram, the MACD is not really helping us, and we are looking to be sideways trading for SQ. If you are going to be looking to an order entry here, SQ or Squarespace, it looks like it's having earnings here on the first. So next week, it's going to be its earnings. Does it follow implied volatility waves? Not really. If you are looking to order entry in this trade, I'd keep a watch for that candlestick to fill. This candlestick is the one I'm talking about in particular right here. This candlestick, this 81 to 78 candlestick for your order entry. It's a nice trend candlestick because you can see right now we are inside that candlestick. So you're either waiting for a movement above it or below it for your order entry for SQ. Whew. Can you run through how you find your strategies that start today? When you click on your avatar, I find it difficult. I have some starting today, but I click on it. That's a good question for help. They will actually get you right into that. Uh, Nick has a great video on how to get all those started. And you can find that right here in the University tab. Let's see right. Let's see if I can find it. Boop, 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 boop. So it's gonna be difficult for me. Anyhow, it's in here. I guarantee you there is a beginner's how to use the site here. There's also, if you have any other questions on how to use the site, there's a helpful community here that will help you. And you just type in chat. Uh, not type in chat. Chat will help you here. But if you need help here, you can go and you can go to the help page, and the help page will help you. Any questions you might have right here, if you need help, just click on the help button. You can start a new conversation with both these contributors. Mike is here. Nick's here. A lot of people are here, and they can help you set up your scans and any questions you might have on how to build the site out to how you want to use it. If you have not been to the University tab in quite some time, it's been current. It's currently getting restructured here. You can see we have all our swing trading with Micah. You can see day trading with Swalik. He's our resident day trader. He trades Monday through Friday. He's a prop trader and he has a great trading system. And if you've not tried, uh, if you've not been to one of his classes, I highly recommend to go into it at least once in your life. Here, you have Q and A with Nick's where he has a lot of the questions and answers you might be looking for inside the chat. And here's my mark, my daily market recap where it starts around 4:30 p.m. With that being said, though. This has been your portfolio growth. I'm Jake Pelly. I'm going to go get this baby that's managed his way to crawl into my room very quietly, I might add, like a ninja. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. If you have more questions, comments, concerns, feel free to use the chat room. There's a wealth of knowledge inside here. The more questions you ask, the better your trading should become. And with that being said, I'll see everyone in the chat room.